You can only build what you can imagine, and art provides the perfect way to imagine the future. My name's Toby Walsh, I'm a professor of artificial intelligence at UNSW Sydney, and I spent my whole of my life um, dreaming about building intelligent machines. It's hard to think of an aspect of our lives that isn't going to be touched in some way by artificial intelligence. Everything we do, and our jobs, in our homes, in our factories, in our fields, is going to use more and more intelligent machines. And for many respects, that's going to be a good thing. AI can do all the, the four Ds, the dirty, the dull, the difficult and the dangerous. And we can sit back and enjoy the finer things of life and focus on the things that give us much more reward. There are lots of dull, repetitive jobs that we should never have got humans to do in the first place. The fundamental challenge with a technology like AI is it's entirely dual use. There are positive uses of the technology as well as negative uses. Um, take as an example facial recognition. We can build software that can recognize people's faces. And there are some fantastic positive uses of that technology. Uh, here in India, in Delhi, they took facial recognition software and software that aged uh, the face and were able to reunite nearly 3,000 children in orphanages who got separated from their parents. Um, it's a really fundamental good news story, uh, a, a fundamental benefit that was brought by the technology. But the same technology has been used in other places. It's been used in China, for example, to surveil people. They have a system called Skynet, uh, ominously called Skynet, that can scan a, a billion faces in a minute. And it's being used to help persecute the Uyghurs. Uh, a fundamental harm, a human rights violation, that the same algorithms are being used for. So we want the, the good uses without the bad uses. And, there's a really fundamental debate uh, going on. How do we build the technology so it's used in a responsible ways? Uh, I spent my whole life being a scientist, but to find myself talking increasingly to politicians, to diplomats, uh, to boards of companies, uh, trying to advise them about how we should develop the technology, how we should regulate the technology, um, to ensure that we have a favorable outcome for everyone. And it's, an, it's a really important conversation. It's hardly possible to regulate them. You look, at, for example, at places like the European Union, which has been leading the way. General data protection regulations giving us back privacies that we thought were lost. Uh, and also that you should, that these, uh, these are some of the largest uh, corporations on the planet, five largest companies by market cap, uh, at least before the current turndown were, were tech companies. Uh, and we've always had to regulate uh, large business. We regulated the big oil companies, the big pharma companies, the big banks, and now we're having to decide we're having to regulate the big tech companies. Uh, and we've had chatbots since the 1960s. Eliza was the very first chatbot uh, that was written back in the 1960s. Um, wasn't as capable, but even then it was already mistaken for a human in various settings. Well, with ChatGPT, they've taken it to the next level. They've not used it, given it just a dictionary, they've given it pretty much the internet. They've given it all of Wikipedia, all of Reddit, all of the US patent database, almost any of the text you can find on the internet, and trained it on that. And so now it's a different scale. It cannot just finish the word, it can finish the sentence, or it can finish the whole paragraph. But it's not really understanding what it's saying. It's just saying what's probable. And what's probable is not the same as what's true. It, Chat GPT, I think, did surprise many people. I was actually pretty impressed by its capabilities. And so I, I really got a feeling then that this was a demonstration, a te technology that was going to change our future. Um, and there are successes waiting in the wings. We already know that OpenAI, the company behind Chat GPT, has been training its successor, GPT-4 that's supposed to be an order of magnitude bigger. And I think we're going to be again surprised at what it can do. One of the biggest funders of OpenAI is Microsoft. They've already put a couple of billion dollars into, chat, into uh, OpenAI to, to pay for the really expensive cost of training it. Um, and they're talking about investing another 10 billion. Uh, and undoubtedly, 
Uh, the return is that they're going to put ChatGPT or its successor into all of the Microsoft Office. It's going to be in Word. Every time you open a document, you can, you can have the document, you can have this tool help finish writing it for you. Every time you write, open Outlook, you can have it uh, finish or even say, write the whole uh, email for you. Every time you open Excel, um, it's going to be waiting there to, to enter the formulae for you, to help you achieve whatever you want. So it's going to be a really important tool that lifts um, all of our productivity. Whether uh, great artists are going to be replaced, I don't think so. For a more fundamental reason, not just the, whether it's going to technically meet the standards of a sonnet that Shakespeare would write, it's because it won't be as meaningful from a computer, because a computer doesn't have emotions. A computer doesn't fall in love, lose the loved one. I mean, all great art talks to those human experiences, uh, and we're not going to share those, those human experiences with machines. So even if on the surface they make art, poems, or paintings that resemble the art the great artists produce. They're not going to speak to us in the same way that, that art created by humans does. They won't share those human experiences of dying and losing a loved one and so on. The human, human brain is the most complex system in the universe by orders of magnitude. Nothing approaches the complexities of the, the billions of neurons and the trillions of synapses that go into our brain. Um, and so it's a significant challenge yet to build machines that are going to match. But I think it would be conceited to think we won't. What, what's special about human intelligence? We, we are, for better or for worse, the smartest animal on the planet. But there's no reason to suppose we couldn't build smarter machines. I think it would be conceited to consider otherwise that um, the limited intelligence we can build in machines today is, in the tasks it put to, much more capable than humans. We can, write programs that so play better chess than humans, we can write programs that, that read x-rays, interpret x-rays quicker, faster, more accurately than human doctors can. We can write programs that translate tweets of Mandarin into English quicker and more accurately than humans can. Um, so if we start to put all those things together, then I think it would be hard to imagine that we would be stuck with just human intelligence. I'm terribly sad to think. I do think with the way that AI is accelerating into our lives, that that's actually very helpful for the tsunami of problems that face us. I mean, whether it be the, the, the climate emergency, the increasing inequalities we see in our lives, um, there are a host of problems. I'm not forgetting the pandemic, which is not over yet either. There are a host of problems, our aging population. Um, you know, funny enough, a, a friend of mine, Rob Brooks, who um, is the co-founder of, of iRobot, who has built more robots than anyone else on the planet. He's the guy behind the Roomba robot uh, vacuum cleaner. Um, he jokes the robots are only going to arrive just in time. He's not worried about the robots taking over. He sees our aging populations. He sees that, that, that um, more and more of us are getting old and needing to be looked after. And there's fewer people going to be working. And the robots are only going to arrive just in time to solve us from that problem.